you very much for coming here. Um, uh, I met Lily, we were both on a panel together. Uh, I thought it'd be great for the community to hear from her and the youth, the rest of the youth. Um, uh, and I see you've been running around the State House, visiting all sorts of people, which is great, and um, went to a press conference, which is very well done. So, you'd like to, uh, maybe, maybe we should introduce ourselves. So I'm Kirk McCormick, and uh, I'm from Burlington, and I'm um, chair of the committee. And Barbara Murphy, I serve Fairfax here in the State House, and I've, I'm the vice chair of our Transportation Committee. Brian Savage, uh, Swan. I'm Mary Sullivan from the South End Hills section of Burlington. Uh, I'm Becca White, I serve Hartford. I'm Mike McCarthy, and I serve St. Albans. Dave Potter, I represent Clarendon, Westbrook, and Proctor, Wallingford, and a little bit of Tinmah. I was a high school teacher for 31 years, full time. Driver's head. And no, and what, biology too, right? Biology, chemistry, and driver ed. <laughs> um, I'm Molly Burke, and I represent Brattleboro, and I've had the pleasure of knowing Hope. She's been a in turn with me and uh, very impressive. That's why you went right. Yeah. <laughs> so I see you've got prepared testimony. Yes, we do. So whenever you're ready. Thank you, committee members, for the opportunity to meet with you today. My name is Hope Atrero, and I'm a senior at Montpelier High School and a member of Youth Lobby. Some of you might recognize me not just because I'm frequently in the building because of my advocacy and activism, but because I've interned with Molly Burke for the past two years. She's a person who I'm truly grateful I've had the experience to work with. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I'm Lily Platt. I'm a senior at Harwood High School, and I'm an officer of the Vermont Youth Lobby. Youth Lobby is a statewide student-led organization for climate action and justice. As you know, we are facing an unprecedented global emergency. Just thinking about the magnitude of the climate crisis can be so terrifying that it paralyzes people, but we have to do something. The science is clear, and it's becoming clearer every day that we must act. To us, climate change isn't a political issue. It's an existential threat, the effects of which we've only begun to feel. Regardless of what we like to think about Vermont being a green state, the facts say otherwise. Vermont is not doing its part to address the climate crisis. Since 1990, Vermont's carbon emissions have risen by 16%, while climate pollution in all of our neighboring states has gone down. As overseers of Vermont's transportation policy, you have a unique, op a unique opportunity and responsibility to act for serious climate action this session. We appreciate your past commitments to reduce emissions and fight climate change. In 2017, many members of this committee voted in favor of H.R. 15, a resolution which opposed the announced U.S. withdrawal from the Paris Climate Agreement and supported Vermont's enrollment in the, U the United States Climate Alliance. H.R. 15 opposed a world in which the United States, instead of using its power and wealth to serve as a role model on climate action, reneged on its commitment to reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels and by, two, two, by 2025, and its commitment to contribute $3 billion to climate change assistance to developing nations by 2020. Combating climate change, something that scientists have called the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, is not limited to one resolution. And the word resolution has two meanings. It isn't just an agreement passed by a legislative body. It's a firm decision to act, to do something. Supporting emissions reduction takes an active effort, but with our current policies and regulations, Vermont isn't on track to meet its own emission reduction goals. We've committed to 90% renewable energy by 2050, but as of 2015, only 16% of Vermont's total energy consumption was powered by renewables. Uh, as you may know, we're also in the State House today to ask you to support the Young Vermonters United Climate Declaration. We passed it in November when we convened in the House chamber along with 170 students from every district in the state. Um, we held this special session to bring attention to the fact that the state isn't doing enough to address climate change. 
There were students from big schools like CVU and UVM and from rural schools like Barton Academy, <clears throat> Barton Academy and Glover Elementary. There were students who traveled from Brattleboro High School and Burn Burton. Some of us walked from Montpelier High School. The youngest delegates came from Marion Cross School in Norwich while the oldest attended Vermont Law School. We were joined by the Lieutenant Governor, five senators and 22 representatives. Representative Becca White provided an inspirational keynote address from the State House steps. Thank you. Some of the declaration that we passed is broad, including our request that the Vermont State House declare a climate emergency, turn Vermont's non-binding greenhouse gas goals into requirements, and put us on track to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2032. Some of the declaration is specific to transportation, including our recommendations for the following. Accelerate the deployment of freely available, low carbon public transportation, <coughs> such as buses, trains, pedestrian connectivity, and biking infrastructure. Join our regional neighbors in, in programs like the Transportation Climate Initi Initiative and create a 10 year timeline for ending the sale of passenger vehicles powered by fossil fuels and for implementing extensive public transportation infrastructure. The largest segment of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions comes from the transportation sector, and at a figure that consistently hovers around 45%, that represents nearly half of all emissions. As, legislat as legislators on the House Transportation Committee, your actions are critical, and it is critical that you prioritize climate change. In moving away from fossil fuel transportation, Vermont can develop an equitable program to generate revenue that can help all Vermonters invest in and make use of cleaner transportation alternatives. <clears throat> there is growing popular support for climate action. According to a very recent poll, more than three quarters of Vermonters support Vermont's joining of the Transportation and Climate Initiative and more than three quarters of Vermonters support requiring the state to hit its climate targets. By moving away from fossil fuel transportation, Vermonters can reduce carbon pollution and potentially save money at the same time. Studies have shown that in our most rural counties in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, the average driver can save $870 per year and cut carbon emissions by more than three metric tons per year by choosing an electric vehicle over a conventional sedan. Shifting transportation away from single occupancy vehicles towards low carbon alternatives like buses, trains, biking, and walking not only helps us meet our emissions reduction goals, but can literally change lives. Expanded public transportation infrastructure would greatly lessen the burdens that transportation often poses to low income and rural Vermonters, especially those living in fuel poverty. A lack of available commuting options prevents low-income people from leaving their towns and accessing the jobs, resources, and en enrichment they often need to improve their lives. Yes, last year's budget did include funding for electric vehicle incentives, and I'm thankful for those on this committee who advocated for electric vehicle incentivization during negotiations. Yet, last year's funding has been called a quote-unquote modest but positive step forward. We are indeed moving in the right direction, but our progress, as said, has been modest. And unfortunately, incremental action doesn't align with the ambitious goals we've set for ourselves. Incremental action isn't enough to meet our state's commitments to affordability and efficiency, and incremental action isn't enough when it comes to fighting the climate crisis. During the 2020 legislative session, Vermont must continue to work towards electric vehicle incentivization and do so with ambition and commitment if we are to meet our goal of 50,000 plug-in electric vehicles registered in Vermont by 2025. Yes, these are ambitious goals, but ambition and drive are nothing less than necessary if we are ever to meet our commitment to the global and statewide ar arrangements we've agreed to. Taken together, these recommendations can put us back on track to meet the climate commitments that Democratic and Republican governors and lawmakers alike have made to our generation our commitment to 90% renewable energy by 2050. Again, we must do our part. And more importantly, as legislators in Vermont, you must lead the way and prove to other states that we can make this transition away from fossil fuels and toward a more prosperous, more equitable, more equitable and brighter future. Last night, instead of studying for the French test that I have later today or doing my homework for AP Economics, I was up late finishing this testimony. It was something I was happy to do, uh, carefully writing it in the hopes that it will be good enough, that it will match the caliber of the testimonies and speeches you might be used to hearing 
from professionals who are paid to do this every day, who don't spend their hours at school instead, in the hopes that my words, my testimony, is good enough to make enough of a difference, so that it is something you will carry with you throughout the session this year, as you make decisions, set priorities, and negotiate with opposition. Lily and I, and many others our age throughout the years, have skipped school and slipped out, skipped out on sleep so that in addition to all that we do, whether it's soccer or working or high school, we can do our part in advocating for efficiency, affordability, leadership and initiative, and social justice. A commitment to serving others is a principle that guides your lives as legislators, and it's a principle that deeply guides mine as well. For many young people today, climate anxiety has steeped itself in the back of our minds. Those who prioritize climate change understand that it's a crisis, understand that climate change is already affecting us and is a growing obstacle to ensuring every person and every community has the ability to live with stable weather patterns, to swim in and drink from clean, safe water, to breathe unpolluted air, to live free from forced migration, to have access to food, and to live unencumbered by civil conflict and disease. We understand that the world has already warmed by about one degree Celsius and without a global coordinated effort, one that we as Vermonters and as Americans must be a part of, the world will reach 1.5 degrees in as little as 12 years. We understand that several million lives are at stake according to the IPCC. We understand that the actions that are required to ensure a just transition to fossil fuel free world have significant overlap with the actions that would be needed to reduce global poverty. We understand that if we don't act, literal science states that whole parts of the globe will become too hot for human habitation and those left behind will die of heat. Diseases will increase and mutate. Food shortages will become chronic as we fail to move agriculture from one climate to another. Whole countries like Bangladesh and parts of countries such as Miami, Florida will be underwater. Shortages of fresh water will affect humans and agriculture. The oceans will die and air will get dirtier. Social, economic, and political chaos will ensue as refugees flee areas that can no longer sustain them. Although you and I enjoy spending time with family, reading a book, going out for a bite to eat or a run outside, and can afford to live and work relatively comfortably in Vermont, there are people in the world, as we've seen in Australia or in California, who are being affected by climate change already who do not have the privilege of living and working relatively unperturbed by the effects of climate change. We have two asks of you today. The first is to do all you can to reduce carbon pollution. As overseers of Vermont's transportation policy, you have an opportunity to act. As you know, the bulk of Vermont's greenhouse gas pollution comes from transportation. I'm sure you saw the most recent greenhouse gas inventory report, 45% of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions come from trucks and cars. So the bulk of greenhouse gas reductions have to come from transportation. We understand that there are a number of bills under consideration and in the process. You should enact all of them. No one bill is going to solve this crisis. You should pursue as many strategies as possible. Our second request is that you hang this declaration I, it's, <laughs> <laughs> is that you hang, our second request is that you hang this declaration in your committee room for the remainder of the legislative biennium to remind yourselves daily of what young Vermonters want. We want a cleaner, healthier, more vibrant Vermont. And every day that we continue to spew climate pollution into the air robs us of that future. At its most basic level, Youth Lobby is asking for policymakers to ensure that as a state, we're doing our part to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to a level that is consistent with a livable planet. We simply want the state of Vermont to abide by the obligations we've, we have made to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Accords and to listen to the IPCC and the urgent and most current science. It is imperative that we act soon to prioritize co combating climate change and making the switch to clean energy, infrastructure, and livelihood. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and we're happy to answer any questions if necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent testimony. Okay. Well done. Uh, questions? Oh, 
Well, don't have Dave. a question, but I do want to just go on to the fact that when you spoke of you're hoping your testimony was of quality, that I think you probably exceeded what many people would get paid to that. <laughs> Please, Barbara, I don't have any. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if I have a question, but a comment kind of along the lines that you just talked about. That. You know, uh, I was contrasting your testimony from what we saw yesterday in the larger body, and uh, you know, if you want one legislator's uh, take on the effectiveness of the, in contrasting the two, you know. Your, your, your testimony is so articulate, and uh, it indicates that you, you, you spent a lot of time uh, studying or uh, investigating what you're talking about. You know, you seem very believable, to uh, at least to me. I was a science teacher, and so uh, you know, maybe it's easy for me to follow what you're talking about, but. You know, you did such a nice job, and it's really, uh, you know, I'm an older age. It's, it's very uh, comforting to see people like you in high school that are, are young and so intelligent. And I would look forward to the day when you come and replace some of us that are older. <laughs> and uh, because you're, that's, you're the kind of people we need in these sort of positions. And your day will come. It's not too far in the future. Um, so I have a very specific question for you. Um, and I wish very much that you didn't have to be here giving this excellent testimony and that we were more capable as the folks who are governing, helping to govern Vermont, of combating this crisis and taking it as seriously as you do. But the question I have for you is that you mentioned the Transportation Climate Initiative is one of the policies that you want us to take serious look at and to pursue. And we're going to hear over the next couple of months, and I've already heard from a number of people, um, that Vermonters just simply can't afford to spend another dime on anything related to investing in climate change from a number of people, including constituents. So I'm wondering what you would say to some of the folks who are going to be talking to us and are concerned about us doing something as a regional partner to make those investments in a lower carbon transportation future? Um, I can, well, I spoke at the press conference last year, and that was the same day that a lot of the green vests, I don't know if you remember them, but um, came to protest carbon taxes. And um, I think the media did a sort of pit us against that group, but when I actually researched some of what they had said in their speeches, I agree that when we do make a transition to a greener Vermont that we need what we call a just transition and that those who can't afford to pay can, um, I, don't, I don't know exactly what we would do, but perhaps it's subsidies, perhaps it's something else, perhaps it's electric vehicle incentivization, but that people who can't afford to pay, I, I, speak, I spoke about fuel poverty as well in my speech, but um, that we can transition to a Vermont that is not just, um, we can transition to a Vermont that's not just greener and produces lower emissions, but that is hopefully more affordable for low income and rural Vermonters to live in. And when we do implement policy, it's important that we have low income individuals at the table. I myself am low income, and so it was hard to see um, what I was saying be pitted, pitted against those who, um, largely share some of the same interests as me. I think that perhaps because I'm younger, I understand, I've, I've spent more of my life being acquainted with the climate crisis, and so I think that it is an, there's an understanding that is more prevalent in my mind that the cost of inaction is greater than the cost of action. Um, yeah. Mayor. This isn't really a question, but I also wanted to just um, kind of reiterate what um, what Mike just said. That I, I, while it's wonderful to have you in the state house, I'm really actually sorry that you have to be here and work so hard in this issue because it does mean that we let you down and we're putting your jeopardy and uh, your future in jeopardy. And um, let's hope that we can really ramp it up and. Um, 
you know, just so that you can look forward to a future that when I was your age, I looked forward to, so. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, very impressive testimony. Um, what I'm wondering is, and, and I think, you know, articulating the, what's, what's happening is the narrative is, is getting like, this is a carbon tax and we can't do it. So therefore we can't do anything. And that is such a lack of vision because we can, and, and you've talked about a little bit, how some kind of a, you know, subsidy or, or whatever. That, that's something we need to talk about. Have you met with the governor? We have not, but it's something that we have been talking about. I think that you need to present what you've just done to us to the governor. Mm. And, and as a counter to what happened yesterday, you know, with, with however many colleagues will come in with you. And if you need help facilitating that, I'd be happy to do that because Thank you. this is really, really important for the governor to hear that you're not just talking about a carbon tax and that how seriously you take this and how much you're working. And everything you said today about you would rather, you know, you're not in school because you're doing this. You're doing the work that this body should be doing. And thank you so much. I think the governor would be happy to meet with you. I don't think he'd have any problem getting anything with the governor. We would like to. And um, we'll be coming back to the State House every Friday. Great. Um, do, participating in Fridays for Our Future, which is a, a worldwide uh, event. And uh, we're also planning a larger youth lobby event in late February or March, where we'll be lobbying specific policies um, and hoping to have more meetings with more committees and hopefully the governor as well. You know that we're on break the first week of March, <coughs> just for your plans. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, we don't want to plan something. It would be important to mind, <laughs> yes. And I, I would say, uh, to follow up on that, that town meeting day is probably a great opportunity yeah. for the youth lobby to meet with local leaders. Um, I'm also a municipal leader, <laughs> and a number of us are involved in our local governments. So I would really encourage um, the, your larger youth lobby to go to town meetings, to be at City Hall and places that have Australian ballot on town meeting day if you can, and, and to talk to, with local leaders because <laughs> a lot of the advocacy that needs to happen is not just here at the State House, but it's also down at the town. So uh, you have been so articulate and have framed the message so well uh, that I really hope that youth lobby members will talk to local officials about some of these issues so that we're hearing from them as we move forward with some of these policy priorities. Do you really have a French exam today? Yeah, I mean, it's not like that big. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like one of the, in a half hour? It's like part of something that accounts for like 60% of my grade, but it's fine. <laughs> no, it's actually like, I think I'll that be good. good. This she was more important. She got into Columbia University. I did, wow. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And Willie, really, you really worked till 10 o'clock, according to one of your emails to me when we were trying to arrange for this. <laughs> she works around the clock, I'm pretty sure, yeah. 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 Do you work? Pardon? Where, where are you oh, um, the sweet spot is a cafe in Waitsfield, <laughs> and I also work at the Pitcher Inn, which is a restaurant and hotel in Warren, Vermont. Wow. <laughs> well, I would just like to reiterate what, what Dave said. <laughs> just for doing some reiterations. Um, yesterday, did you hear what happened yesterday? You did. Okay. Yes. The governor just started his speech, and um, yeah, I fear that that was actually a step backward. And, our advocacy to address climate change. And you guys did the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Besides the fact that you were, your yes, testimony was so good, so well done, so compelling, you have delivered it right, you, you know. Willie and I, it took, it took some work to just to get this, but when you talk about what you guys have done, so this, you didn't just meet with us, this is a hearing. Okay, so you, yeah. mm -hmm. we had a hearing um, with you guys. So that's what this is, okay? And uh, I just want to thank you again, and we will hang the poster. Thank you. Thank together. you. Um, yeah, I, I understand where you're coming from about the demonstrations that were held yesterday, and I would like to acknowledge that uh, they were justified demonstrations, in my opinion, that the house is on fire, that we're living in a crisis, and everyone should be heard. And that the direct action um, 
was led by youth who are putting in the hours just as we are and although they expressed it in a different way and in a way that might be considered abrasive to some legislators um, that it is an expression of genuine and justified concern and in that regard we're both coming from the same place and that we are both concerned about the climate crisis to a huge extent yeah could i add a, just a, a following up on mike uh, Mike's comment, you know i think it'd be very productive if somebody from your organization or multiple people from your organization were in every town at every town meeting and because there will be a counter uh, viewpoint presented mm -hmm. to what you say and you if you have somebody there that can ar as articulately express your concern as uh, as you have done at those town meetings it will be very very uh, useful because there's a lot of education needs to be done across the state mm -hmm. at the grassroots level uh, before and and that that effort will cause change in this body if you can get grassroots support for what you're talking about and there's a lot of work to be done so if you can organize that so that you're sure as many as possible can get go to this town's meeting you have a right to speak as much as anyone else and you do it so well let the records show that the cell phone ringing was not one of the speakers. I was definitely one of the elders in the room. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.